but people didn't want to be seen as anti-vaxxers. To be an anti-vaxxer in Australia is like the worst of sins. It's like being seen as a racist. It's just something that nobody wants to be associated with in any way. So because we gave a voice to those who had concerns was the right thing. But for some people, it just dissociated the church with something which they find anathema. Hi, I'm Evelyn Ray. Welcome to The Cauldron Pool Show. This has been an episode in the making, let me tell you. We have been trying to get all four of us on here for quite some time. We actually did manage to do that a while ago, but due to technical difficulties and everything happening all at once, we had to postpone and reschedule. And today we're doing that. And today's episode is all about the Ezekiel Declaration. And we're going to get into that in a little bit, but I would like to introduce the guests today. We have three incredible Australian ministers joining me. We have Matthew Littlefield, we have Tim Grant, and we have Warren McKenzie. So I just want to thank you all for coming here. I'm aware that we're all on here together. So I might start off with you, Tim, if you could sort of introduce yourself to the audience, uh, a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah. So Tim and I'm uh, the pastor of Mount Isa Baptist Church. We've been here for three years. It's a wonderful church, wonderful church to us and a wonderful location. Um, I've been a pastor, youth pastor for over 10 years, uh, and I've got a wife and three girls. My wife homeschools, and so it keeps us fairly busy between uh, pastoring and my wife homeschooling and and uh, and everything else. So happy to be on today. Awesome. And how about yourself, Warren? Are you able to sort of introduce yourself for our audience as well? Sure. Yeah, I'm Warren McKenzie and pastor for Bioda Baptist Church in Inala, Brisbane. Uh, we're a small um, a local church and uh, my family and I serve there and I've been a pastor now for a little over four years. Awesome and yourself Matt? Yes yeah, so I'm the pastor at New Beef Baptist Church and I've been there since 2017 and I've been a pastor since 2011 and I've got a wonderful wife and three kids and I love Ford. I love the St. George flag, which is why it's hanging behind me. And no, that's not the football team for those who like rugby league. It's the um, the guy who defeated the dragon. Uh, and I, I'm an occasional contributor for Cauldron Pool as well. Yes, you are. And I must say, I very much enjoy reading what you have to write. And I especially love the fact that you're a little bit of a historian buff like myself. But that's another story for another time. Now, I really am grateful for all three of you for joining me today, but not just that, for all the work that you've done, um, in particular, over the last couple of years. I know personally, um, I struggled to sort of find where I fit in terms of theology and in terms of the church and the church's response to everything going going on with the pandemic. Um, and you three um, was were people that I really admired and was really encouraged by your bold stance on not segregating people from church based on their private medical choices. Um, Many churches fell, unfortunately, to that division and the segregation. Um, but you three were all part of something really incredible that actually didn't just stay local in Australia, but received some international attention as well. And that was the Ezekiel Declaration. Now, for those who might be tuning in who aren't aware of what the Ezekiel Declaration is, I'd love, Tim, if you could kind of give us the concise, as best as you can, version of what the Ezekiel Declaration is and why it is that you three participated in bringing something like that forward. Yeah, so the Ezekiel Declaration was an open letter that we started penning probably about this time last year. It went, uh, it went, it was published at the end of August, and it makes a petition to the Prime Minister, uh, mainly not to segregate society. We, we begin it by appealing to uh, Abraham Kuyper, who also wrote a similar letter back in about the 1850s or 60s regarding inoculation. And his position was that, uh, you know, it would be the, the, the segregation would be worse uh, or the vaccine certificates, that system would be worse than the inoculation uh, or ha having the inoculation itself or the, or the sorry, the virus itself. So he, he wrote a letter uh, and got 40,000 signatures on it. You know, we only got about 30, 26 or 30,000 signatures. So I lament that we didn't uh, <laughs> live up to Kuiper's uh, uh, achievement. <laughs> Uh, but our letter goes through a number of points. The first is that, uh, you know, a, a vaccine uh, passport system would segregate society. And uh, from a 
the Christian ethic perspective, we thought, well, that it seems the reasonable uh, Christian response not to segregate society based on um, medical choice. Um, mm. And also that this kind of system um, that excludes one, you know, through through the type of technology we have, would really set a precedent or the, the, the mechanism for greater technical uh, technological control in the future as well. Mm. So that was the first point. The second point was that a good portion of the population had already been uh, burdened uh, by lockdowns and that follow lockdowns followed by lockouts would uh, just really break a lot of people to say that, um, you know, I, for my personal choice, I, I'm not going to be vaccinated, but now I've been locked down for X amount of time and now I can't do anything. And that happened, you know, particularly in Northern Territory and, and, uh, and uh, Melbourne uh, as well. The third point was, oh, well, this was conscience. Um, a, a, a big, uh, a major distinctive in Baptist um, ecclesia, um, theology is the, to, to provide liberty of conscience. That says that the state can't answer for me before God. Another person can't answer for me before God. Mm. Uh, I have to give an account uh, for myself before God. And there are some things that the state is under the state jurisdiction, that is to punish evil through the civil sword. There are some things that God commands that we must obey. But there's some other things that God has provided liberty on. Uh, you know, Romans 14 discusses what we eat, what we drink. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20 says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Um, mm. So glorify God in your body. So we're, I'm under no illusion that God could act on conscience on what we do with our bodies. Um, so we needed to, we wanted to make a statement that conscience was an important faculty uh, in the in in, uh, in life and also in 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 democratic society. Mm. Uh, the fourth was um, it, it just didn't make any sense. We were reading some of these scientific reports that that noted that there were breakthrough cases. You know, I think there was a, a cruise ship at the time when everyone on the, the ship was vaccinated and <laughs> everyone got sick. That happened a few weeks ago as well. So uh, it just seemed from the science at the time, and which has I think uh, vindicated us that. Um, these weren't effective in stopping transmission. And the fifth was, well, particularly this is what uh, motivated me, is that, you know, I had been sitting in my church office since the start of 2021, you know, thinking that there might be a period in the next few months where the state would enforce a state uh, a vaccine passport on my church and there would be some expectation that I was meant to exclude people. And that was unthinkable to me. Um, you know, Christ sets the entrance into who comes to church um, and who, who can't in the case of excommunication, but the state has no jurisdiction um, in the role of who gets to come to church. So that was the, the last and fifth point that, um, yeah, we're not going to exclude people from our services. And it's interesting, those five points that you outlined in uh, the Ezekiel Declaration, you would think that those five, those five points would be at the forefront of every church, of every Christian heart and soul, you know, to not discriminate, um, uh, or divide, segregate, especially when it comes to the call to worship, the call to gather and to, uh, you know, the fellowship within a church. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'd like to say that I'm surprised by people's responses, but uh, the last couple of years I'm getting quite, uh, I guess, <laughs> I'm not so shocked anymore. But before I get into some of the, uh, I guess you could say, pushback and criticisms, I did want to ask Warren, um, mm. you know, how it is that all three of you came to be um, working on the Ezekiel Declaration together and whether... Um, it was a difficult decision uh, for all three of you to do this and come out publicly because at the time, um, I guess you could say you guys did this early, um, which sometimes, you know, has a bit of backlash. So, yeah, I just wanted to sort of gather uh, what brought you together and whether it was um, a decision that you had to use a lot of discernment on whether it was the right time. Yeah, sure. You know, I, the guys might want to add to this, but my understanding was that Tim and Matt had been working together on, on things previously and um, they became aware that I was concerned about government overreach and just put an invite out for me to be involved in the Ezekiel Declaration. And uh, when I 
uh, read what the guys were putting together and, and saw what it was about. It just was very clear this is right to, to be involved in. And uh, so, yeah, we just started to uh, proceed from there. So I'm not sure if the, uh, Matt or Tim want to add to that at all. Yeah, I can uh, jump in there. Yeah, so it started, actually, I put up a, a post in a, in a pastoral discussion group uh, just saying, guys, what's going on? Are we going to speak up? And the response I got was actually hilarious. It was exactly what I expected, but it was actually more um, more that way than I even expected. I thought there would be more guys who wanted to push back, but like one of the comments was, we think that uh, the government's doing a fantastic job and we love everything that they're doing. And I saw all these comments, I was just like, my goodness, they're further gone than I thought. And so I think I actually, um, I just removed myself from that discussion, but then Tim flicked me a private message a little bit later and said, I saw your post. And that's when Tim and I started talking. And when the, uh, when the QR codes, it's interesting, because when the QR codes came out, to me, it was just obvious what they were going to be used for. It was just obvious. I mean, everyone thought, well, these are just for contact tracing. But no, QR codes enabled uh, the government to put restrictions on who could go into different places. And we already saw that happening in different countries. And there were people predicting that that would happen. But I, just, it wasn't, I don't even think it was a prediction. I just think it was obvious. And so uh, when Tim reached out to me, and, and in fact, we'd already discussed it at our church that we weren't going to segregate. And so when Tim reached out to me and said, would you like to write a public letter? I was like, absolutely. I was a little bit um, trepidatious at the start, not because of what the contents of the letter were, because I agreed with Tim 100%, but because I was uh, facing some uh, conflict in my own sphere <laughs> that I was having to deal with at the same time, which made it a lot harder. But it was it just needed to be done. And I, I said this uh, at, at a talk a couple of weeks ago, but a lot of us younger pastors, we were waiting for the head guys in the church to say something. Uh, we were just we were, I was expecting someone from one of the big churches or, you know, one of the more high profile guys, one of the big apologists, you know, the guys who really say they defend liberty. You know, you, you saw them talk about liberty all the way up until about March 2020, where they just went silent. <laughs> and we were waiting for them to speak and they didn't speak. And so when Tim asked me to join him in the letter, I was like, finally, absolutely. And and then uh, Tim contacted Warren a little bit later. With, and, and yeah, that's that's how we joined together. Um, the rest is history. <laughs> I, I was probably a little bit naive in the sense that I thought what we wrote was just basic Christian ethics and basic mm. Christian faith. And so I was deeply shocked at the response that we received. We just thought, we were, I just thought I was doing something fairly Christian and fairly Baptist. But mm. you didn't worship vaccines, Tim. You didn't worship them. And because of that, it, the tone was all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it does seem like the, you know, there were certain things implemented during the pandemic that became like the saviour, that became the messiah and really took people away from uh, the correct sort of theology on many different things that people put their hope in lots of things other than Christ and people really... Yeah, as you said, I think I was probably a little bit naive as well. And similarly to what you said, Matt, is I was sort of waiting eagerly you know going someone is surely going to speak up about this mm. like, and you know someone is surely going to do this so that we don't have to and one <laughs> I'm I'm a woman like I don't feel it's my place especially um you know to, to have authority over a church like you know that's not my place at all so you know you kind of sit in the pews waiting for these great men that you've respected for a really long time to sort of step up and take that burden um, off the church's shoulders, I guess, mm. and, and the people and, and do that. And, you know, I, I think I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but I served in the police for 12 years. I resigned in 2020, but I had a lot of connections and friends in the police force during the pandemic. And like what you guys were saying, there were a lot of junior police officers that sort of was speaking to me privately, sort of saying, we don't like what's happening, but no one is talking up about this. There is no one who is willing to publicly come out, especially people who were high up in the police to sort of say, this isn't right. And I saw a similar pattern with the church. Um, but, you know, it, it, I guess it's not all doom and gloom. Look at the success of the Ezekiel Declaration. And I do think it's amazing that there are younger 
uh, shepherds coming out to lead the flock and to lead them back to, you know, scripture and back to the Bible and back to having their hope in in Christ and not the vaccine. But I wanted to sort of talk, maybe you could go into this, Tim, a little bit about the criticisms that the Ezekiel Declaration saw, because um, there was, I think, a number of I guess you could say hit pieces or there, there are a number of things that came out, you know, not a lot of people were willing to speak out against what was happening to the church during COVID, but a lot of people were willing to speak out about this Ezekiel declaration letter. So if you could give your experiences and some of the criticisms um, and how you sort of refuted those criticisms, um, just for people who might not be aware. Yes. So in probably the, about the second or third day, our letter had been shared by federal and state MPs, people like George Christensen, Craig Kelly, a number of other uh, MPs as well. And so it got a lot of traction uh, quickly. We were just simply looking for a few like-minded pastors who might, you know, sign this open letter with us. And it, it snowballed uh, and, and got tremendous um, uptake on it. Um, but in, in that, about four or five days afterwards, we started getting uh, the pushback and, and quite... Um, incredible pushback. Um, one particular online publication had uh, one high-profile Baptist minister write what I would see as a hit piece on us. I think he linked us, linked us to the, you know, that sort of January 6th insurrection in um, uh, in America. <laughs> you know, we were these type of uh, hillbilly type of folk who uh, just didn't get it. Um, and then we were uh, we were going to squash the uh, government's attempt at achieving a certain percentage of uh, vaccination rates. Again, quite bizarre, as this person was a Baptist, you know, we think, well, liberty of conscience is a, is a basic Baptist distinctive. Uh, that uh, same online publication wrote a number of um, uh, articles about us, you know, endeavoring to reinterpret Kuiper, I, I would say. Um, a, a, another online, um, you know, Big Eva publication wrote a letter about why these people couldn't sign the Ezekiel Declaration. Uh, but they did say that there might be a time when they would have to make a courageous stand and refute it. They, they agreed with us on some points. They said we, we too would make a courageous stand. But then a few days later, that uh, online publication released another article advocating for vaccine passports. So we spawned probably, I, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight pieces against us. Um, a number of denominations came out uh, with, with um, you know, disavowing and distancing themselves from us as well. I don't know, Matt or Warren, did you have a better? I was, I was in a bit of a daze because of the uh, amount of criticism we received. So, I don't, Matt or Warren, have you got any? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I just remember I, uh, it was a crazy time. But to me, it was it wasn't so much. I mean, there was, like you said, the pieces from those different evangelical publications. Some of them quite well known and quite prominent. Uh, there was there was a lot of pushback. But I mean, a lot of it was just centered around the fact that they were trying to they were blaming us for uh, you. Well, you guys are going to be responsible for stopping the vaccine uptake. You know, we're not going to get back to freedom until we get to what was it at the time? Wasn't it supposed to be eighty percent? Mm. If I remember correctly. When we get to 80%. And yeah, well, it was going to change because we were supposed to get back to freedom once the, the first two weeks was over. It changed continually. And there are still people to this day who are friends of mine who cannot work. So my my um, I think the, the criticism just all came down to fear. I really do. I really do. I just think it came down to fear. People were afraid. They were afraid of the virus. They were afraid of the government. They were afraid of the congregations they're afraid of how people would view them i know one person who said to me you're going to get our church seen now as the anti-vaxxer church which is just completely wrong because our church doesn't have a position on vaccines and, and i don't think a church should it's it, last time i checked it's not in any of the catechisms it's not in the westminster catechism it's not in the 1689 london confession it's not in the apostles creed it's not in any of them so mm. why would i take a position on it you know what i mean uh, what I'm taking a position on is that people should be free to choose. And so the criticisms, uh, the criticisms for me was more frustrating uh, how the instant attack from people who took, like you said, Evelyn, I think you alluded it to before, completely silent as towards the oppression that was coming down. But when a few, uh, and we're just small church pastors, spoke up, 
then the pylon began. And the way that was used by some people that I know was actually kind of frustrating because it's like, we're just trying to defend people's right to be free. But people didn't want to be seen as anti-vaxxers. To be an anti-vaxxer in Australia is like the worst of sins. It's like being seen as a racist. It's just something that nobody wants to be associated with in any way. So because we gave a voice to those who had concerns, many of whom have spoken to me personally, who were either vaccinated or weren't against vaccines, but were just concerned about this one, um, the fact that we gave people a voice was the right thing. But for some people, it just dissociated the church with something which they find anathema. And this is this country is very radical on this issue. And it's actually I already knew that before it came out, but I was I was shocked at just how much it was that way. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. As you said, we are quite radical. I mean, we've sort of had these things in our framework for a very long time. Some daycares and schools, like children can't attend unless they've had certain vaccines, not just that. Um, Centrelink, welfare, like you're not eligible for certain things unless your child is vaccinated. So we've had the framework there for a long time. So one would think that with a bit of discernment, when this happened, you could see where it was going to end up. Um, and I wanted to sort of ask you, Warren, what your thoughts were, because you guys put out the Ezekiel Declaration before it had actually been mandated or before the church had actually started segregating. And it was more of a, I guess, the way I interpret it, a warning, like this is to come. And what I thought was there was a lot of spiritual discernment from all three of you to have the foresight and and to see where it could go. And I thought that there was potentially a lot of spiritual blindness in the church to not be able to see that. Would you sort of agree with that, Warren? Yeah, definitely. Well, I think both the guys had had instances where they talked about this possibly coming in, this segregation, and were told, um, no, that would never happen. There were so <laughs> many that would never happen that were all along the way through this, and then they happened. And then it was people who seemed to agree in the early stages that if it did happen, it, would, it wouldn't be a good thing, mm-hmm. then turned around and agreed with it and went along with it anyway. So I think that was really disappointing to see that. And, um, and it was all made, always it seemed to be church leaders looking for a way to make it work rather than being principled and say it's not uh, it's not right to um, mandate this or take away people's basic human rights um, every every next stage of overreach from the government was how do we now change our stance and make this work so that we can just oh and I think it was just that desire for it to be done and dealt with let's just obey let's just even if we don't agree with it let's just get it done so we can go back to normal um, which wasn't the case though Mm. And I wanted to ask you, Tim, do you think now that this has happened, um, do you have a fear that this could happen again in the future with churches um, for something else? Or do you think that what you guys did has emboldened enough people to sort of step up and sort of uh, speak out against these things if it was to happen again in the future? I I was disappointed at the response of Church pastors, leaders, there was a lot of, um, you know, pastors that signed the declaration and came to our support. But overall, it just seemed that there were more who were, as Warren said, looking to justify a position of compliance. Um, So, you know, if you read church history, um, books like Torture for Christ with Richard Vermbrand, Bonhoeffer's Experience, uh, um, actually some of the books on, on, uh, you know, Stasi, you know, say that the Christians really had no joy because they knew their pastors were reporting on them. Uh, and that's something that happens over and over again when the pastors side with the state. Mm. Uh, it's it's just a, something that reoccurs in history, uh, you know, because of pastors, um, I, you know, as Matt said, a fear of stepping out of line. And one of the things that I've had to acknowledge, well, that's happened in this in this period is, you know, my reputation has been nailed to the cross. <laughs> you know, a lot of things for me have been nailed to the cross. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I can't be, um, uh, you know, be held into fear uh, by the state. And uh, that's occurred in history. So if it happens again, I expect a similar response. 
Mm. Yeah, it's 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 sad, but I was asked the other day in an interview that I did with someone from America, um, you know, why did Australia fall so bad and, and do you think it would happen again? And the answer was to the latter of that, yes, I do, because I don't know if we've done enough reformation and regeneration within the Church of Australia for us to uh, sig make significant differences again. If it was to happen next week for monkeypox or so something else, I'm sure we would have the same response. What I wanted to sort of uh, ask you, Matt, is the main criticism for the Ezekiel Declaration was centred around Romans 13, and that is the role of the civil government uh, and in relation to God. And something that I heard a lot of was sort of what you said, Tim, and what you said, Warren, in that um, they tried to just make it work and a lot of people sort of had – this fake or this false buffer in their mind, oh, well, when they cross God's law, then we won't segregate. But at the moment, it's reasonable. We'll, we'll obey Caesar because of A, B, C, and D. And I thought and I found that people's understanding of Romans 13 was incredibly uh, almost heretical in nature. Um, and I sort of wanted to get you know, your sort of response to the criticisms of Roman thir Romans 13 and how it was that you could sort of refute the claims that the Ezekiel Declaration uh, compromised the understanding of Romans 13? So uh, one of the most important points of Christianity is that Christians are not anarchists. We are not anti-government. Um, even though some of us may have been accused of that in the last couple of years, Christians scripturally speaking are to respect the governors to respect the authorities which are in charge and respect the role of governors and so all of that is what romans 13 teaches and you've got one peter chapter 2 and other passages in in the new and old testament which talk about the importance of government leadership but those passages don't just talk about the role of government they also, they also talk about what is not the role of government and John Owen, the uh, famous Puritan, who you might be aware of from the 16th century, he put it very simply, very simply that there are different spheres of authority. And the way a lot of Christians view it, and you could you could call this the Anglican view. And I'm not being unfair to Anglicans here. Australia is actually a very Anglican country for obvious reasons. We were founded by an Anglican country. We were um, we most of our influence in this country religiously has been Anglican. They're one of the major denominations in Australia. And the Anglican Church has a very a close relationship with the state. It is a state church in England. It's not in Australia because we have a slightly different setup, but in England, the head of the physical church is the monarch, which is Queen Elizabeth. And originally it was Queen Elizabeth I. And then you had like, well, actually originally it was Henry. So what I'm pointing out here is there is a view in the church, um, which I would call the uh, the church, the, uh, the state church view, which is that the, the, the state does have authority over the church and has authority to tell the church to do on a lot of different matters. The Baptist position, and this, this Baptist position has also been taken on board by modern Protestants in a lot of ways. Uh, Presbyterians now have this view, Pentecostals and a lot of other denominations, even a lot of Anglicans have this view, is this idea of these spheres. And what John Owen, who was a Congregationalist, uh, a Reformed Congregationalist argued, is that rather than viewing it as God, state, church, family, it is God is above, and then you have three overlapping spheres of influence. You have the state, you have the the church, and you have the family. And these fa these these uh, authorities directly answer to God in their areas of authority. They don't answer to each other in those areas. Now there are areas in which they do answer to each other. For example, uh, the fam the members of the family have to follow the road laws or you know, the, the, the laws, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, things like that. And this teaching uh, comes from a, a, a correct application of Romans 13 with Romans 14 uh, informing it. Because if you read Romans 13, and, 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 and Tim can say a lot about this because he read uh, Roger Williams' book in depth. Roger Williams, who was also a Congregationalist, who actually became a Baptist for a little bit. He was one of the, it was the founder of the first uh, religiously tolerant colony in the world called Rhode Island. Uh, it's in North, Northern United States. Uh, he argued and that the state has the authority to punish according to the second tablet of the law, civil laws. I referenced them before. Uh, whereas it does not have the authority to punish people according to the first tablet of the law, which are religious laws, which are laws which are dealing with beliefs about God. 
And he pointed out, and if you read Romans 13, it's not a coincidence that Romans 13 is followed by Romans 14, because what is Romans 14 all about? It's about conscience and not overriding the conscience of your brother or sister in the faith. And so what people were doing, I mean, I, I can see why you see it as a heretical view, because in a lot of, even if you were to even speak to, I think, to a lot of Australian Anglicans before 20, 2020, they would have this Baptist view of this separation of church and state. Now, the separation of church and state for Baptists is not the idea that Christians should have no influence on the state. It's the idea that the state needs to stay out of certain things, which are the responsibility of the church. And when you put all of this together, you understand that the government does have a proper role, but it doesn't have any medical authority over you. There's no medical authority given to the government in scripture. It also doesn't have the authority to overrule your conscience on disputable matters. Mm. Now, for example, the, the state has the authority to punish you for stealing. It has the it has the authority to punish you for murder. It has the ability to even punish you for adultery. That's on the second tablet of the law. Our state doesn't do that, interestingly enough, but it has that authority. Uh, it even has the authority to punish you for lying. Again, that's on the se second tablet of the law but it doesn't have the right to punish you on things which are of disputable matters. And so what the church did for whatever reason is it defaulted back to this old church state view, which gave the, the, the state the ultimate power. And the problem with that is it, it deletes conscience and it forces people into a crisis of conscience. And that's why we wrote the Ezekiel declaration because we could see it coming so clearly because it had already come. And you know how we knew it was already, how, well, part of why I knew it was coming or saw it coming, was just because they'd already done that. That forced us to choose between obeying Christ and gather and, and not gathering. Um, sorry, I'll put it this way, say it better. They forced us to choose between gathering or staying at home. And that tore Christians up. It really tore them up. And the church didn't understand, sorry, the state didn't understand the impact it had. And I think a lot of pastors didn't understand the impact that had. So I, I hope that explains why uh, we disagreed with a lot of people's approach to Romans 13. I understand why you call it a heretical view. I would just say it's a, it's a view which the Baptists uh, soundly rejected and our view won, won the world. And we, do, um, we just deferred back to it in a moment of crisis. And the reason why we defer back to it, I'll finish with this to let the other guys speak, is that which you fear will control you. That's what the scriptures teach. That's why we're supposed to fear God. Because if you fear God, then you'll obey him. But if you fear anything else, it will control you. And what we saw in 2020 and 2021 is what people really fear. Absolutely. That, do, do... That was, sorry, I was going to say, yeah, um, that was some of my concern initially of how I got involved with these guys was because I, I was raising questions about what the government were asking of people and commanding of people was actually going against God's commands. And it's in, in that instance that we have to look at something like Acts 5 where we are to obey God rather than man. And we do that in all areas where there's a authority and submission um, spoken about in the Bible. So whether it's um, uh, the authority that's given to a husband, uh, to, to a father in the home, um, there is to be submission in the home, uh, where children are to obey their parents, where congregations are to submit to um, the leadership in the church, um, none of those positions are ultimate and absolute power. God doesn't give absolute power to human beings because we're sinful and uh, we'll corrupt that very quickly. Mm. Um, and so we, authority, human authority is always limited. And so that was the, the key issue for me was when we start getting told when we can sing, when we can gather, what you're to wear when you sing, um, and how close to other people you can stand when you're singing and gathering, um, all things that um, go against God's word of, of gathering together. Um, singing is not an optional thing. It's a, it's a command of God. Mm -hmm. And so where there's that tension where it's saying you can't do the things that God commands, well, very simply we're to obey God rather than man. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very simple thing, you know, give to God what belongs to God, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And the church is certainly not Caesar's. And, you know, I guess that's where I thought like people's response to Romans 13 was heretical in that it replaced, um, I guess, God with the state 
as the mm. ultimate authority. And that's sort of where I really found it uncomfortable with the church's response. Um, but I wanted to sort of talk just briefly, and I might ask you this question, Tim. We were seeing a lot of videos for uh, around the world of different ministers and pastors who, like you three, stood up against the state um, and against these segregational type issues within the congregation. Canada, for example, was probably where I witnessed the worst of it. There were ministers that spent time in prison because they refused to close their doors. There was one minister um, who refused to put a, a cap, a limit on who could come in. I think they had, you know, a limit of, I don't know whether it was 50 or 100 people. <laughs> James Coates. That's right. And, and you know, he was like, I'm not going to, you know, have people come in with a little clicker with, okay, that's enough. Now I've got to shut the doors on these other people. And they spent time in prison. And I guess my question was, did you have a fear that this could potentially happen to, to you over here in Australia? Because we saw lots of videos of uh, police brutality, uh, police overreach, and there, there was a lot of violent videos, especially coming out of like Victoria that we were getting circulated. Were you looking at that thinking this could potentially be me? Um, yeah. And, you know, I guess my next question would be like, were you willing to go as far as some of those other ministers that we saw spending time yeah. in prison for yeah. those Yeah, so choices? that's one of the reasons I we wrote the letter because I thought it was appropriate that before I went to jail, <laughs> that I say, you know, there's an issue of conscience, there's an issue, a religious issue here that you shouldn't overstep, um, and, and to make that known to the state, to say, here's a line that we cannot cross, and you are getting very clo close to making, um, you know, pastors um, mm. have to make a decision and, mm. and uh, you know, obey God and be disobedient to state commands, which we don't, we don't want to do. We want to be obedient people when there's good laws. Yes. When there's bad laws, you know, we, you know, especially as they relate to the church, the gathering of the saints, we have to obey God. So that's that's why we wrote the letter. You know, I don't I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to be away from my family. I want to make it known that, hey, here's the issue. But if you overstep that, then I will need to obey God and follow in suit with those Canadian pastors. So, yeah, for, for a good many months, you know, I resolved in my mind that this was the line. And in, in fact, uh, we, I think Matt's going to talk about our book soon. But you know, there's a there's a quote in there from um, the the Lutheran pastors. I think it's in 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 Poland about how the the pastors who set the clear line before the communists came in held their ground and they went to jail, but they were known afterwards as the men of principle. The guys who didn't have a line kept redefining the line. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that book, uh, the 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 Hungary, Hungarian pastors uh, under um, uh, under communism, uh, you know, it's, it says of, of, of one of the men, he loved the church, but he just became a quisling. He followed all the state commands um, and was ineffectual. Uh, so, so you need to set beforehand where the line is, otherwise you would just keep redefining it. Was this really hard on your families as well? Like I, I know you have children and wives and like what sort of toll did this take on them knowing that potentially their husband and or and the father of their children could have to make this tough choice. I'm not sure if any of you want to jump in my, here. Yeah, my well, my wife just a few weeks ago was reading actually, and I think Tim alluded to this account or a similar account of a uh, man in Soviet Russia whose wife challenged him that if he didn't stand, that's yeah, Richard Verbrand. Yeah, uh, she wouldn't respect him. <laughs> I don't so, want to count uh, for a husband. <laughs> Say again. I don't want to. That's said, it. Yeah, Richard Vermbrand, when when the when the communists came in, they gathered all the um the pastors at, at, a, at a at a local meeting where they were um, promoting the unity between communism and the church. And uh, Richard Vermbrand's wife said, "They are spitting in the face of Christ. You need to say something." I don't. And he said, "If I stand up, you won't have a husband." And she said, "I don't want to coward for a husband." Yeah, so she I'm was very aware, very well aware of that account it's before amazing. as well. And she was reading that, and uh, that was part of the devotions for our kids. Uh, Kirli, because we homeschool, she does. That's my wife's name. She uh, does uh, devotions with the kids at the start of every homeschool day, and that was what she was talking about and reading that story. And I was just listening to it, thinking that's one that Kim shared. Uh, sorry, Tim shared with me. And look, at the end of the day, yeah, we wrestled with it, and. Uh, 
we didn't know what was going to happen. But you have to draw a line somewhere. If you don't draw a line, you just become an agent of chaos. Uh, I was going to read it, but I'll just refer to it. I was reading a, uh, a little bit of uh, Plutarch's Lives last night, which is the big book behind me, the red one. And I was reading about this uh, ancient Roman tyrant. And this guy, it, these kings in ancient Rome, this is before the Roman Republic had ultimate power. Uh, they, they, that's why they called them tyrants. <laughs> they could do whatever they want. And this guy, it, it describes him, he lived, he had all this power, but he lived in utter fear of everyone around him. He was in such fear that he wouldn't even allow someone to cut his hair because he was afraid that somebody might take him out while they were cutting his hair. So he actually got a friend of his to use burning coals to shorten his hair. <laughs> Imagine what his haircut looked like. Wow. Uh, he he was he he took all these crazy restrictions. Like anyone who came to his house had to undress and and then redress with the clothes that his guards gave them. And all these crazy restrictions that he put on people because he was terrified. And that's what fear does to you. If you live in fear, you live in a in a very narrow terrifying world where you can't do anything you lose all your freedom this guy's a tyrant i mean he's a king he's both he has all the power in the world but he can't enjoy any of it because he's given over to fear and so at the end of the day if you're going to live in that way then you won't be free it's better to be it's better to to do the right thing and be free uh, and and face the consequences than to live in fear mm, definitely and i wanted to ask you warren um what the response was like um, with your congregation, like whether, and, and maybe all, all three of you can sort of weigh in on this, whether you had the support of your congregation and the respect of your congregation and I guess the people around you. Yeah, definitely. We, we had, um, yeah, quite a, a big number of our congregation who were um, wanting uh, me to be vocal about the issues going on and appreciated that they would hear things about um, what was taking place, uh, and they supported um, opening up um, in regards to if lockdowns were going to continue, that that we would seek to open the church. Um, there were some people, obviously, you know, concerned about that and wanting to understand it more, um, and then some who were willing to um, be led through that, even though there was some uncertainty. But for the most part, yeah, we were... Um, we had a lot of support from the congregation and we started to have people who came over to us because they were so frustrated with not having these issues spoken about or the continued compliance to government overreach. And so we had more people come across as a result of that as well. I'm guessing there are a lot of refugees, a lot of people looking for churches who uh, did actually take a stand during that time. I know a lot of hurt Christians who felt, uh, I guess, betrayed by their church. And now that, you know, the government have said that church can open, they feel a bit hesitant to kind of go back to the church that kind of cast them mm -hmm. out. And we're seeing a lot of, yeah, a lot of hurt. And, um, you know, I haven't seen a lot of bitterness as of yet, but unfortunately I, I feel like this could lead to bitterness amongst Christians, which is obviously not what we want. Mm -hmm. So I guess my next question, and maybe you could answer this, Tim, is what do we do now? What do Christians living in Australia do now? And what sort of hope do we have to mend or repair the church? And what should Christians be looking to do in the future, I guess, with their relationship with the church? Um, it, uh, if you're in a church where they removed you, they didn't allow you in because of your choice, I'd be looking for repentance on behalf of the leaders. Um, there might be opportunity to find a church. I say this hesitantly because I, I'm not one to want to create division, but there might be need to find a church with a more faithful pastor in that regard or more faithful Christians. I've been in contact with um, a group of Christians in the Northern Territory who were under immense uh, strain. They were locked out, lost their jobs. And, uh, you know, Mike Gunner had some incredible rhetoric. You know, he said, even if you uh, have had the vac vaccination, uh, but you're you're for choice. You're an anti-vaxxer. So they were under some incredible stress, and they had no pastors to go into bat. And I've spoken to a number of people in house churches now in Alice Springs, mm. um, 
So, yeah. you know, that's just one of the regrettable um, outcomes of this, that it has caused division um, because it's, uh, you know, mandate on a matter of liberty. This happened in American prohibition as well with the issue of alcohol, that people became friends or foes of the law. Um, so, so, yeah, I think that's the, the reg regrettable outcome that either there needs to be, it would be great to have some sort of rep repentance or acknowledgement from denominational leaders, pastors who, who just went every step of the way with the state at the expense of co people in their congregation who had a troubled conscience. Mm. Yeah, Can I just I also think, add, sorry, yeah, I was just going to add, that, yeah, um, and it's not as though, in, I think in, in that shifting of some people moving churches, it's not, it's not just a case of, oh, people are looking for a, an anti-government church or something like that. And um, while there'll be some, you know, people here and there who, who definitely have that leaning of looking for a church where it's going to be so much spoken about that, uh, for what we experienced for the most part was people coming over who just wanted to know that they were in a church where when it came to the crunch, when the government were overstepping their God-given authority, that they belonged to a church that would stand up for them and would be vocal on these matters and mm. would continue to lead them according to God's word. And so they're, they're people who are not, yeah, not these crazy anti-vaxxers or anything like that. Um, they're just people who want to um, be fed God's word, make disciples, um, live out their faith in, in community, but know that they are, um, being shepherded by by leaders who will be vocal when we need to be and lead lead accordingly. I think people just want uh, leaders who actually just base their theology from scripture and not theology from the government and what the government mm. say they should interpret scripture as. I think, like you said, unfortunately, anti-vaxxer has become, as you said, Matt, the biggest sin. Um, you know, it's, it's, this, it's this radical idea that if you refused uh, the vaccine and not only refused, you might have it, but you refuse to accept that people don't have a choice. You've been slapped with this uh, derogatory term um, and the term has been sort of hijacked. Um, and, you know, I think people are just wanting a church where they feel safe because like all aspects of of a body or a home um you know that that's they're the things that you protect the most the whole world can be chaos but if, if your home and the four walls of your home are protected your family your body is protected then you can face the persecution and the trials somewhat um better i guess and can i just mentioned my motivation was came from john chapter 10 where it mm. speaks of the good shepherd who's of christ but we're under shepherds under him and when we see a wolf coming, yeah. it's my job to lay down my life and take on the wolf. And like Warren said, you know, we have people who are deeply concerned, had issues of conscience to say, you know, we're about to lose our jobs. We're not sure about this out of some reason of health or ethics. And they're coming for the church. They're going to segregate the church. You know, as a pastor, I have to say, well, this is where I need to lay down my life. Yeah. Um, and nail yeah. it to the cross. So that was my motivation. John chapter 10 of knowing that I had to, you know, step up and <laughs> in the face of that wolf, as it were. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm encouraged because, I mean, I, I think your, your question is a great question. What does the church do going forward? But what I love about the church is it's not led by men. It's led by the Holy Spirit, Christ mm -hmm. through the Holy Spirit. And he's already doing what's um, right by the church, or doing the best thing for the church. And what he's doing is the church, I believe, the church grew in the last couple of years. I mean, I know my church grew and I know some other churches, but I don't just mean the institutional church. I've spoken to so many people who are meeting in homes, who are gathering, who are bringing people from off the streets into those homes. I spoke to someone just last week uh, who just shared with me and I just encouraged him keep doing that because you guys who are doing that are well ahead of the rest of the church when something like this happens again. You asked before, should we fear this happening again i'm not afraid of it happening again i know that something is similar could happen again and very likely will happen you don't fear it you just prepare for it and you expect it mm. we were told not to expect an easy life the problem is most of the church forgot that and when it became hard uh, they didn't know what to do but i think we should see the last couple of years as training and uh, I, I, think, I think it's awesome to see these people doing church in creative ways. I think it's also awesome to see the churches that stood, that are growing. I, I, I know another guy 
um, who's got a church in a couple of different states and the way his church grew during that time. But one concern I do have, and I think it's something which society needs to be really attentional about addressing, is the fact that hurt people hurt people. And what I mean by that is those who have been abused or those who have been uh, uh, severely oppressed or damaged can actually be hardened towards the struggles and suffering of others. And I actually think to a large degree that's happened on our, in our society. A lot of people in our society lack compassion for those who lost or injured um, during the last couple of years because of government policies. And they just like, well, they're just casualties uh, of the situation. We've just got to toughen ourselves and get through it. Well, no, 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 no. Those people were wrong. And if we just move forward with that kind of attitude, I'm, I'm not really excited about the kind of society that we could become. Mm. And so I think, I think one of the, the church, we can't solve all of society, but I think that that's one of the things the church has to really wrestle with because there are, you, I'm talking to pastors now, some of you really hurt people because of what you did. And I know that because they've told me and I know it because they've told Cauldron Pool and they've told others. And you can't just say, well, you were just a casualty of that time. We really need to wrestle with this for there to be a, a healthy way to move forward. Mm. I think there's a lot of healing that needs to happen, a lot of reconciliation. And I don't think those things can be achieved unless, yeah, we do have intentional um, conversations like what you said, Matt. I think it's very important for people to have that reconciliation um, to move forward and not carry bitterness around for some time, uh, which then causes more hurt people and the cycle continues. Um, but, you know, you mentioned before the church wasn't really prepared. And I think it's unfortunately because of like prosperity gospels and, you know, only sort of showing people um, God's goodness, but not showing you God's wrath. And I think that that's where a lot of theology has been misunderstood and is part of the big Eva, I guess you could say, um, and things like that. But, you know, I, I like you, I, I'm encouraged. And I, I actually do think a lot more people have turned to Christ. I did that speech in Sydney at one of the rallies. And afterwards, we handed out hundreds of Bibles to people all around the country and some people overseas who, you know, heard Christ is king and that, you know, the greatest th threat to tyranny is a group of people who pledge their allegiance to something greater than the state. And, mm. you know, people sort of felt really, I guess, moved by God in that. And, you know, praise God, there, there is a new era of shepherds and there is a new era of um, Christians who can hopefully um, be really structured on good theology, good doctrine, and can really, I guess, change the generations to come in the future. So hopefully we never end back here again. That's my hope and my prayer that our children never have to face these tough things um, that we've unfortunately plunged them into. But I, I wanted to sort of finish off um, about with, sorry, the book that um, Tim and Matt, you guys co-authored together, because I want to sort of give something for people coming away from watching this, what something that they can do additional and extra. So if you guys wanted to talk about this book, which I think is so important for people to have and for people to read, um, yeah, go for it. Fight over it. Who wants to go first? <laughs> uh, I'll go first uh, and then Tim jump in. So you could you could think of the book as sort of the extended version of the Ezekiel Declaration, which uh, Tim and I wrote. We actually intended to uh, write some articles actually for Colgen Pool, and we started writing them. And uh, what happened is uh, the reason why we decided to write this book is very simple. We the the out the uh, the response we got to the Ezekiel Declaration, we I expected it to a degree, didn't expect it so much, and and we we were actually uh, horrified by how much of the church, especially uh, Baptists around the country, had forgotten the importance of liberty of conscience. And so we, 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 Tim and I were just talking about this, and we, we've got a group of pastors that we talk with regularly. Warren's a part of it. And we're just like, look, maybe, we, maybe people just aren't aware. Maybe people don't actually understand the history of liberty of conscience. And, the, and, and they particularly don't understand the way that it's transformed society for good. So what we did is we started writing these articles, and uh, I said to Tim, I said, look, these are going to be some long articles. He's like, well, we'll have to break it up even more. And I said, we got to like about 20,000 words. And we're like, 
I think this could become a book. And, and, and Tim's like, well, I think it's going to be a very short book, <laughs> which if you look at it, ended up not being the case. It's not so short, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, 100,000 words. Yeah. How many, sorry? 100,000. Yeah. 100,000, yeah. So this this book gives you the history of liberty of conscience in the West. It, it go, It's called Defending Conscience, How Baptist Reminded the Church to Defy Tyranny. And the reason that it's, it's titled that way is because it was originally the Anabaptists and the Baptists who who uh, brought this concept to the foreground. They didn't invent the concept. The concept goes actually all the way back to the early church. You can see it in t- taught by the church fathers, Tertullian and, and, and other, other church fathers. And what we show is that the Baptists really brought this into the foreground and convinced the church of the importance of liberty of conscience. And, and it, really, it really actually became, it didn't become accepted in society until a famous Anglican took it on board. And that Anglican's name was John Locke. And he turned it into a, a broader English doctrine, which ended up influencing countries like this, Australia and the United States. Many people don't realize that Australia was influenced by the same sort of philosophies that the American founders were influenced by. And so what we show in this book is that the, the church and the world is at its best when the church is at its best and defending the right things for the world. And we also show in the book an example of what happens when the church doesn't defend conscience. And then what we do is we, um, we, we apply this to the, the COVID-19 years. Do you want to add to that, Tim? Oh, really, I, I can only say is that my motivation for writing is because I had read a good deal of Baptist history, you know, the history of the English Baptist as a four-volume set, where the first two and a half volumes is basically just Baptists from prison, undergoing persecution, having their property taken away, confiscated, um, not allowed to, to worship together, uh, advocating, writing letters like we did, from, from prison and, and signing, co-signing them saying, uh, you know, we would we impl- need the right to worship according to conscience. Um, that, that book, The History of the English Baptist, Volume 1, begins with these words. Liberty of conscience was taken away and the most cruel and barbarous actions were committed. And whenever it has been so, those who are branded with the name Anabaptist or Baptist have been sure to feel the sharpest part of these things. So the Baptists in history have felt the greatest suffering when liberty of conscience was taken away because we all people should know the need to worship according to conscience. And that's just one book. That's in the first part of the um, uh, 17th century in England. And then you can trace that all the way through people like John Bunyan uh, and then in the New World in America, Roger Williams is another incredible uh, fellow who wrote a book by the name of The Bloody Tenant uh, of uh, the Persecution for the Sake of Conscience. Um, where he was banished from the Massachusetts Bay, Col- Massachusetts Bay Colony. He objected to having atheists take Christian oaths. He objected to uh, the magistrate taking um, Indigenous land under the name of the Crown. He objected um, to the, the, the magistrate enforcing the first four laws of the, the law of Moses. And he was banished. And like Matt said before, he founded Rhode Island, a place uh, that in the charter, town charter, said that this is a place where we will not molest the consciences of, of its people. Uh, mm-hmm. Roger Williams was followed by a man, by Isaac Backus, who was one of my favourite uh, persons to write about, where in America they had the issue of religious tax. The Congregationalists forced Quakers and Baptists to pay a religious tax, uh, even if they didn't attend a, a congregational church. They could get a religious exemption. But even the Baptists said, well, we're not even going to get a religious exemption from you because we say that that is a power that belongs only to God. We're not going to attribute a power to you that belongs only to God by getting by paying tax or getting an exemption. Um, And, and, you know, all through history, the Baptists and their appeals for conscience were disregarded by a lot of people. Oh, that's not an issue of conscience. That's not an issue of conscience. You just (laughs) don't want to pay money, you know. Uh, So the, the Baptists fought and struggled. Um, it's, it's, you know, a lot of blood was spilled for, for conscience. Uh, and so yeah, I was aware of the history. Um, you know, there's, there's a quote that we make mention of when John Locke um, tried to attribute liberty of conscience to uh, some other fellow. He said uh, it was the Baptists who fought for this. Now, there's a little bit of, um, you know, dis- disagreement whether that quote or not was true, but it's certainly true that the Baptists fought for it. So that's why um, I knew I needed to write the book. It came out of necessity uh, because... This is basic Baptist history. And, and Warren didn't um, help write the book, but he is in the book. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he's, he's 
he's in there because he uh, helped initiate this whole thing with the Ezekiel Declaration. Uh, the book is written for people to be a resource, to encourage you. It's written for all Christians. Liberty of conscience didn't become the, the, the real blessing for society that it could be until it was all denominations who took it on board. And like I said, if you had spoken to most Christians, whether Anglican, Catholic or anything in, in Australia and up until the beginning of 2020, they would have said they were believers in the, the liberty of conscience. Um, but, uh, but for Baptists, it's a distinctive. It's not just a. It's not just something that we 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 think is a good idea. It's actually at the core of our understanding of scripture, um, and so that's why it's titled the way it is. But it's important to understand all Christians need to take this on board. Uh, all Christians. I don't care what denomination you're from. We need to like brothers and sisters advocate for this concept, and so that's why we wrote the book. We want to encourage you guys. And, and uh, we want to give you something that you can say to people, look, this is, we're not just radical, crazy, anti-vaxxer, extreme, anarchist, libertarian, whatever you've been accused. We're actually thoughtful people who are trying to defend an important principle that the West actually uh, it applied and it made the West one of the best places to live or the best place to live in the world. Mm. And where can people get a copy of this book? Yeah, they can go to defendingconscience.com is the best place in Australia, uh, www.defendingconscience.com. It can be ordered there via print. Um, and if you're overseas, you can get it on Kindle. You can search Defending Conscience on Kindle as well. Yeah, and I do you recommend want to people get it. <laughs> no, yeah, okay. so it's, been, it's been recommended by uh, Steve Shavura, Dr. Steve Shavura, right before. Uh, Bill Muhlenberg is, has endorsed it. Uh, John William Noble. From, a, from England has endorsed it, and Pastor Bob Cotton, who's written some uh, articles for Cauldron Pool, has endorsed it as well. And Matt, when's my pre-order coming? <laughs> it should be It should be there soon. It should be there soon. I was just going to say, in Australia, you can also read it on Kindle. I know some people love to read on their Kindle device, so you can get it on Amazon at Kindle. But the best place to get a physical copy in Australia, as Tim said, is defendingconscience.com. Uh, the, the, the pre-order should be there. Yeah, any... I was at one of my congregants' house yesterday praying and, and it arrived while we were just talking with each other. So they're out in the mail and they're, they're arriving. Yeah, they're coming. Yeah. I don't I think, send them. <laughs> <laughs> I think people that read books on Kindle are aliens. That's my personal opinion. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I like the hard copy. I love the hard copy. If it's on something digital, chances are I'm probably not going to read it. That's honest truth but um yeah it is good that you have it on both because everybody's different obviously and like it differently um but no i encourage everybody to actually get it it is such an incredible resource especially now that the precedent has been set especially now that things like this have happened it is unfortunately likely to happen or probable to happen again in the future and having this there to read for yourself um and not just for yourself but you could gift it to people who might be struggling or on the fence or not really aware of things it's really good to have so i'm really grateful for all three of you and for your contribution to the ezekiel declaration and for your contribution to making this book before we finish before i wrap it up i'm going to put you on the spot here warren to lead it uh, and everybody anyone can jump in afterwards but if there's anything that you wanted to say to people who might be listening whether it be ministers or members of congregations or people who might not be in church is there anything encouraging that you might want to say to sort of uh, send us off Sure. Yeah. Well, I think just from the last two years, there's a lot to to learn from it. And so whether you were someone who saw it happening and, and were vocal about it or stood up against what the government were doing, or whether you're someone looking back and you're going, uh, we could have done that a lot better. Um, let's, let's go forward together, um, learning from the last two years. Um, let's keep the core business, the core business that is we are to make disciples of the Lord Jesus and so um, God uses all things for his glory and for our good. And so uh, may this time have served that purpose as well. Like we've talked about today, people coming into the body of Christ as a result of the searching or the questions that have come out of it. And uh, let's keep that core business about growing people in the scriptures and um, speaking the gospel to, to our world around us. Anything Others? from... From uh, you, Matt, or from you, Tim, before we sort of wrap oh, it up? I'd probably just say draw the line in the sand of your principles before you get there. Otherwise, you won't have any principles at all. You'll continue to redefine them. Yeah. And I just want to add to that by reading my favourite quote from the book, which is actually a Captain America quote, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is, 
It doesn't matter what the press says. It doesn't matter what the politicians or the mob say. It doesn't matter if the whole country decides that something wrong is something right. This nation was founded on one principle above all else, the requirement that we stand up for what we believe, no matter the odds or the consequences. When the mob and the press and the whole world tell you to move, your job is to plant yourself like a tree beside the river of truth and tell the whole world, no, you move. Mm, great way to finish off. Well, you know, we've, we're coming up on the hour, but uh, Tim, Warren, Matt, I honestly am incredibly grateful and encouraged by your steadfast faith and conviction and your boldness during all of this. Um, and I, I wish you nothing but the best. Um, and I hope and pray that your congregations continue to grow, continue to bear good fruit. And um, yeah, I guess I hope you never have to write another Ezekiel declaration. I hope that's the end of it. Yeah, someone but... else can do that next time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I'm, I'm so grateful for all three of you for, for taking that stand as a Christian living in Australia. It was very much appreciated. Appreciated. So God bless you all. Thank you, Thank you so much. much.